wanted to give everyone a chance to get here and okay. I myself to get here because I taught until just moments before the beginning of this event. Um, before I introduce our wonderful speaker and her book and the title of her book, I just want to first thank the Critical Race Studies Program at the UCLA School of Law and the Center for New Jersey Studies for co-sponsoring this event. And I want to ask you to please pay attention to the fact that a sign-in sheet is circulating. Uh, and please sign into that sheet, which will enable um, these programs to remain in touch with you about the calendars on a very sporadic basis. So don't worry, you will not be inundated with announcements, but we would love to have you uh, in touch with us as programs that sponsor um, events of this kind. Okay, uh, the second thing I want to announce uh, before anything else is that there is a discount flyer at the front along with a sample copy of the book. I'm just going to come here and illustrate to you what I'm saying. 20% discount copy of the book. Please feel free. I'm, in fact, maybe going to start circulating the book now. Um, just pass it behind you and, and make sure that it circulates around the room so you can have a sense of the book, which, of course, you'll get an even keener sense from the talk that you're about to have the pleasure of listening to from Nadia, but I strongly encourage you to take advantage of the 20% um, discount flyer that Cambridge University Press provided for this event to enable you to get a copy of the book. Okay, and with that, um, Nadra is going to be speaking to us about her book, which is entitled <coughs> Security Theology, which, by the way, is not security theology, but common in between. It's security theology, the theology of security, surveillance and the politics of fear, which is also the title of her book. Nadra <coughs> Shaluk Kevorkian is the Lawrence DeBeal, with apologies to anyone who knows how this name ought to be pronounced. I'm going to say Lawrence DeBeal Chair in Law at the Institute of Criminology at the Faculty of Law and the School of Social Work and Social Welfare at Hebrew University in Jerusalem, Israel. She also serves as the Director of the Gender Studies Program at Mada Al Carmel, the Arab Center for Applied Social Research in Haifa. Um, I am going to take this opportunity to welcome Nadra to the podium, and then at the end of her comments, I will ask her a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up to Q&A from the floor. Nadra. Thank you, Asla, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming. It's really wonderful to see wonderful friends, to see my, my editor from Cambridge University, to see all the new friends, and even colleagues from the Hebrew University. So this is mm -hmm. a wonderful um, opportunity. And to come back to the law school <coughs> here, I was teaching here for a long time, so it's really nice to uh, use to be here. And now to launch the book is a uh, Great pleasure. So thank you, Asla, and thank you all for coming. Uh, as you can see, you can speak a bit louder. Uh, I'm sorry, we just we. Oh, Unfortunately, oh. there's a there is a microphone, but it's it's there to capture her voice Whoa. for the podcast as opposed to I'm amplify sorry. her voice. So maybe you can step if you want to step out from behind the podium or something. Well, or just project. I'll try no, to no, don't worry about it. <coughs> and maybe. For those who are having any difficulty, if you want to come closer yeah, to okay. the front, that might also help. So the, um, the title of the book, Security, Theology, Surveillance, and the Politics of Fear. And let me um, say a few things about the argument of the book. In uh, researching formal state violence and the violations of human rights in the past 20 years in historic Palestine, and I would say in different colonial contexts, one can realize that all colonial bureaucracies, emergency laws, regulations, and practices, whether hidden or apparent, were developed to new modes of surveillance, management of populations, and legalized violators of citizens' rights. Legalizing <coughs> and justifying the use of such draconian emergency interventions that were turned into security concerns based on fear from the dangerous entities became part of a legal matrix of control in formal democratic uh, regimes, so-called democratic. At the same time, when studying the colonized, I learned that living means to keep on existing when every day is a victory. The native struggles to bring an end um, to domination, but as Fanon, Point, he ought equally to pay attention to the liquidation of all untruths implanted in his being by oppression. Following Fanon, the book examines the voices of those who keep on existing and explores Palestinian experiences of life, death, 
within the context of Israel settler colonial and colonialism. It draws from aspects of the intimate, the bedroom, everydayness, and moves between the local and the global to introduce the term, the politics of fear and security theology. And it is in the intimate, in the everydayness of oppression, that the home, the ordeals of birthing women, the reading and writing of the living power of Palestinian dead bodies, and within securitized justifications, homeland security, and moments of security threats, used by Israeli settler colonial state and its surveillance regime that might hold basis its analysis. The analysis presented in the book looks at the colonial and settler colonial conditions, but with a focus on the Zionist and the Israeli state regime in historic Palestine to help us understand how racialized surveillance and control of the colonized are carried out through laws and practices of control that manage, invade, classify, categorize, and govern the colonized. The, books, the book looks at varied systems of separation and bureaucracies of control and management utilized through a political economy of fear and to be more accurate, an industry of fear, to nullify, classify, and identify dangerous entities, turning the native population into unwanted others that can be a threat <coughs> to the settler state. The book looks at how and in what way surveillance, securitization, and the political economy of fear affects Palestinians. The research shared in the book reveals that an invisible order of dispossession and the machinery of oppression and power is at work all the time but I really emphasize the everydayness and the intimate level of this machinery. And this order and machinery of power is affected by a settler colonial logic and is embedded in the invasion of the intimate. And it's in the body, the sexual, the politics of everydayness, the home space, and the community space where colonial rules, policies, and bureaucracies create ghettoized spaces and times for the Palestinian now, my understanding of settler colonialism is that settler colonialism is a structure, is not an event. And, set and settlers are there to stay, which means they try to, um, to evict the native, turning the settler into the indigenous, so the indigenization of the native is there. And it's built on a logic of elimination, as many uh, scholars that look at settler colonialism. My reading of colonial occupation provides two critical insights into the colonial speciality of power arrangements. The first relate to spatial and territorial fragmentation, cutting off people from each other, sealing off some areas, constructing new and expanding older settlements. Such territorial fragmentation, I argue, and separation limits and restrains people's livelihood, hinders their mobility and accessibility <coughs> to resources. It forges an everyday panoptic space characterized by significant topographic variations and invades the very intimate sphere of life, including the body, time, and spaces of birth and death. The second related to surveillance and the construction of psychosocial political traps that are developed by the colonizer to manage daily spatial and social life and creates multiple separations that result in the creation of not only isolated places, <coughs> entities and communities, but also isolated individuals, isolated families that live under constant fear and terror and are feared as terrorist others. And this is where the industry of fear is maintaining the power and the regime of the settler colonial state. Therefore, I conclude in the book by showing the ways in which the violence and trapping of Palestinian intimate spaces, bedrooms, bodies, and lives reflect the emerging necropolitical regime that communicates its power over the home, the homeland, lives, and bodies of Palestinians. So the first <laughs> section of my talk, I want to engage you 
in a fast manner with an overview of how security theology inscribes power over Palestinians in occupied East Jerusalem. So I will only take the case of East Jerusalem to take you in a journey with what goes on. And, and especially with a focus on birthing women and the mere moment of birth, how security theology, surveillance, and this political economy of fear invades the moment of birth. Mm -hmm. And in the second section, I want to take you to the first chapter of the after the introduction that looks at surveillance over <coughs> <coughs> surveillance over walls to share with you violence inscribed over spaces, over bodies, and over lives, mainly with a focus on what we call um, fear, which is price tag. So let me start by, um, usually, thank you, um, by borrowing from the voice of a Palestinian, uh, where am I here? Lama. And let us say, I was born in Jerusalem and my husband is Jerusalemite, but they still can't decide whether I deserve the Jerusalemite ID or not, although my family is from here. My pregnancy was filled with severe anxiety, fear, feeling of depression, always constrained, and thinking about each and every act, feeling always trapped to the degree that I was dreaming about being tied up with wires. You know the wire that the Jews put uh, on the checkpoint, those filled with edgy ends, the barbed wire? That was my dream, being tied up with barbed wire around my face, even inside my body, preventing my lungs and heart from working. The night before I had my baby, I had him four weeks before time, the due date. I was on duty in the hospital. I closed my eyes to rest, and then came thoughts of barbed wire, the inability to breathe, and so much anxiety. Then I started feeling pain. I called the doctor and my husband, and they ordered the ambulance for me. At the checkpoint, they question my pain when I'm wet, all wet, and they can see it. I lost my water, the baby was drying up, but we were held at the checkpoint without even having anyone to look at our faces or talk to us, as if we are animals. Even the hospital here is like a prison. Look at all women around you. Each one has a story. We all are, we all persecuted prisoners, and this is a dilemma. So what we see uh, in, in, in her voice is a clear example of how I see and analyze security theology. Lama speaks of the invisibility as a sense of not being valued to the point of feeling as if she were an animal, yet the experiences she relates point to her extreme visibility as she traverses the spaces allowed to her. Childbirth is a particular moment for exploring the ways in which surveillance and securitization <coughs> is intimately connected to the body. Since the body is also intimately and already connected to space, to time, exploring how power relations are manifested in the matter of childbirth and the body in the context of military occupation is critical. And when you look at what I'm showing here, you see that Israel is to stop issuing birth certificates to children of foreigners. And if, if you would guess who are the foreigners, mm -hmm. the foreigners are Palestinians living in East Jerusalem mostly. And I'll share with you the data more uh, at a later stage. Now, when, when, and this is a, uh, this is the table that uh, I gathered showing two different uh, modes of statistics. We have here the Israeli Central Statistic Bureau data, and we have the Palestinian Central Bureau data. And if you look at the data at the live birth only, you will see that the live birth by the Israelis are 8,299, the Palestinians are claiming 3,042. So there are 5,000 kids that we don't know where are they, while the total population by the Israelis is 283 and the Palestinians 382. Wow. I can talk more about it at a later point, but that tells you a story. The reading of the above contested numbers are at the center of my argument, for these numbers cut into the very fabric of Palestinian existence and contributes directly to a production of knowledge that destroys Palestinian women's chances for a safe pregnancy and delivery. The reading poses questions about that which is hidden behind the numbers. 
what is embedded and what the numbers are telling us because there is a story behind those numbers. Each number is telling the narrative of those that have gathered the data and produced the number. What is embedded in the control over the social fabric of everyday life, birth and death. And here I borrow from Edward Said's uh, point to us that the fact that uh, what lies behind the archives of the colonizers as behind the statistics of the occupiers, as in, in my study, are racial ideologies and hierarchies. It's the obsession of the occupiers and their bureaucracies and bureaucrats with the intimate details and who is sleeping with who, and this is why one of the chapters is called Israel in my bedroom, Yeah, because I look at the Israeli citizenship law. And who is marrying who, who is giving birth, and whose children are to be recognized and who is not. So, and, and when I go further in a policy paper by uh, Nadav Shagai, Planning Democracy and Geopolitics in Jerusalem, that is, uh, explains the importance of cutting off Palestinians from, um, from each other. The actualization of this as a process of urban planning and especially the importance of this strategy as a way to prevent the strengthening of Palestinian argument and demand to Jerusalem. So he, he goes, the creation of continuous urban space between East Jerusalem and the Palestinian neighborhood outside the city, meaning outside Jerusalem, strengthened the Palestinian claim for a political governmental continuum. Connecting Palestinian building fabric in Jerusalem to Palestinian building fabric outside it might strengthen Palestinians' request to recognize areas in the West Bank and areas in East Jerusalem as one continuum that is only an urban continuum but uh, also a political governmental continuum and so lead to a request imposing an identical political settlement on the area in the West Bank and East Jerusalem. In other words, such a continuum might strengthen mm -hmm. Palestinian claim in terms of the right to divide the city. That is dividing Jerusalem politically to East Jerusalem and West East Jerusalem, turning East Jerusalem into a capital of the Palestinian state when and if established. So to further understand Shargai's point and here, you know, all, all we need to do is to really understand uh, the, the, the policy. I wanted to take you into really a situation of the situation in Jerusalem. So if you will look at the statistics there, poverty rate according to the data, uh, and these are all Israeli data, this is the Israeli um, Civil Rights Association, 75.4% of Palestinian residents of Jerusalem are poor, 83.9 of the Palestinian children living the poverty line, and you could compare it to Jews in, uh, in Jerusalem. Unemployment of men is 33%, women 86%. And when you go to demography, the plan is, as Shargai would say, as others would say, demographers, they need 70% Jews in Jerusalem, 30% Palestinian. Right now we're at 36.8, there, uh, there is a need to evict 6.8%, and that knows <laughs> what else. The Judaization of space is another issue. Uh, turning, there are 55,000 Palestinians after the building and the construction of the Israeli wall were evicted. 130,000 were affected, and 3.7 million pa Palestinians separated from each other. That, in addition to checkpoints, we have those, not the flying checkpoints, but the actual checkpoints are 16. We have over 44 flying checkpoints, in addition to the permit system and the issue of land uh, confiscation and housing devolution. As to the legal status, and this is another issue that I tackle with the a third chapter of my book, I look at the under the Israeli law, Palestinian living in occupied East Jerusalem are permanent residents rather than citizens of Israel, and their residency status is conditional upon their pro proving that their center of life lies within the Israeli defined municipal boundary of Jerusalem. Consequently, their residency status can be revoked. And I'm not joking. You could see what Netanyahu has said lately that he is, uh, that we, if we, if Palestinians want to behave, he could revoke the residency status of Palestinian. And here they're talking about 90,000, uh, and that was uh, lately. So the data here shows clearly that uh, there is a situation that colonial methodologies and manipulations that count the numbers of Palestinians <coughs> who can keep their residency as Jerusalemite, of course, directly account for and in implicate Lama's body as well, situating the body 
in very specific articulation of space, of place, and time. This accounting and precisely the location of Lama's body is a political topography, and it is based on a continual counting and accounting of even the most subtle shifts in population. Constructing the Palestinian as feared other, as a security threat rather than as the colonizing, sustains the state and enhances and naturalizes its power, constructing fear in the subtle, in the subtle so, uh, colonial context and requires the dispossession of the aboriginal, rendering the latest body out of place and out of space. As Raza would say, white aboriginal bodies hunt settlers. A too present reminder that the land is indeed stolen. They must also serve to remind them of their own modernity and entitlement to the land. Violence in a settler colony is in inscribed not only over the body and life, but also, as I would like to claim, over the senses. And here, okay, let me just also show you the situation of the geopolitics, which is in Jerusalem, 13% of the land is uh, zoned for Palestinian. This is, uh, this is occupied East Jerusalem, and the data is based on OCHA, which is the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And of course, the issue of housing demolition that is uh, uh, at hand and working hard. So in addition, we have the issue of sociocide. As I said, 79.9% undocumented children. This is according to the Israeli National Council for the Child. And here we're talking about 124,000 children with no documentation. That tells you a lot. What about their education? What about their health? What about their ability to move? What about uh, accessibility to to uh, other issues, so here <coughs> we have, and the data shows that in the past 10 years, an estimate of 7,000 children have been detained, and I'm not including what happened in the last four months, yeah? During May and June 2014, there was a 5.6 increase in the number of children, and I'm, I'm sure that now the situation is harder, and uh, the data speaks for itself. <coughs> So as I said, in addition to the inscription of power and pain over the Palestinian bodies, and in addition to the demographic uh, um, issue that I have pointed, and I pointed <coughs> in the book while looking at the way laws and, and regulations, whether hidden or apparent, in, in occupied East Jerusalem are, are being affect, affecting Palestinians, there is an aesthetic of violence that is so <coughs> strong and clear. And I thought to share with you one of the um, videos um, what happened during uh, uh, the Jerusalem, so called Jerusalem parade. <laughs> like we don't have families that need to feel safe when 
misleading for children that need to know that, the, that the, at least the walls of their homes are uh, secure. So what is Tag Mahir? Tag Mahir, or Price Tag, is a concept adopted by Israel, including settlers in the West Bank and occupied East Jerusalem, and uh, Israeli media, to identify violence mostly against Palestinians. It is also sometimes violence against Israelis that are supporting Palestinians. Yeah? Um, the perpetrators of Tag Mahir contend that their actions are legitimized by Judaism, particularly the Old Testament, Indeed, the Israeli media and various politicians and activists present this violence as based on religious claims, mostly retaliatory. Tag Mechir's action usually includes racist graffiti often accompanying one or more of the following, burning or uprooting olive trees, torching the religious building and centers, mosques, churches, monasteries, stone throwing, gunfire, attacks on individuals, homes and vehicles, and theft and destruction of uh, crops. And I think you all know and are aware of what happened lately. They not only burned a child in uh, July 2014, Muhammad Abu Zair, but uh, uh, an entire family in the Duma area was burned alive. And, uh, let me start with the graffiti that we find around uh, on, on the buildings and the houses in, in, um, in East Jerusalem and in other places, of course. The graffiti usually written on private property, such as homes or cars or property, with symbol, uh, symbolic values such as the mosque, church, graveyard, and other official Palestinian <coughs> sites aimed at challenging the intimacy or symbolic value of the location, often containing offensive language. There are the torching of religious centers. This is, uh, for example, Muhammad is dead here beside the Greek, um, the Greek church in, um, in Jerusalem. And according to the head of Tag Meir, Tag Meir is an organization that is against the Tag Meir, which is spreading the light, and this is also run by a religious Israeli uh, forum, a uh, forum that uh, was established to combat the act of Tag Meir. Between 2006 and August 2013, 24 mosques, monasteries, and churches have been burned by people who left in their work uh, inscription identifying them as a uh, Tag Meir. And more recent findings based on OCHA database indicate that 37 mosques and churches have been uh, desecrated or torched by persons who left in their way inscription identifying it as a tag of it. According to Avi Ashkenazi, an Israeli newspaper <coughs> reporter, in just the last five years, 44 mosques, convents, and churches were attacked by tag of I will soon show you my own statistics on, on this. And as you see here in, on the church here, and then, you know, just look at an Arab man as an Arab man in a grave. So it's the necropolitics is just uh, is right at work. Yeshu Nekama, you know, Christ like Jesus the carcass, and the, the, the man. Awaiting demolition, looks of this is the burning of one of the most. There was a church beside my house before I came on Armenian Christmas on the uh, January 18, that was also burned. The separation of mosques and churches by Israeli settlers from 2009 to 2014, you could see that it's like in 2010 and 11, it was an increase. Probably this year, 2016, will have a higher rate. Destruction and uprooting of Palestinian trees by Israeli settlers. <coughs> and we're talking about large number of desecration of olive trees. And when you look at Israeli-related incidents resulting in casualties and property damage, and this is until 2014, you can see that there is a large number of of, of the liberation. Now, when I look and when I analyze the Tadmah Hears Act, it's very, very clear that there is a lack of prosecution. Legal scholars and criminologists would argue that the motivation for retaliation increases when the chances that the perpetrator will be punished are minimal. My research showed that a systematic lack of uh, prosecution of Palmyrkis never exists, as settlers are rarely held accountable for their violence, and the Israeli army is often complicit in these acts. You know, only lately, for the first time after the case of burning <coughs> the whole family, that they, uh, they claim they found the, the, the people that committed this atrocity. So Tag Mechir's actions are blessed by some religious leaders, tolerated by politicians, legalized by the state, as they are not outlawed or punished, and tactically endorsed by the security system, which did not react strongly to Tag Mechir. 
This treatment allowed Tag Mechir perpetrators to enjoy impunity. Justifications and interpretations of Tag Mechir's action ranges from <coughs> one that consider their violence a reaction to violent Palestinian behaviors toward Jews, to the ones that see this violence as a response to state's failure to pursue the Zionist dream and protect settlers and citizens, and on to see them to act as self-defense and resistance against hate crime. Uh, author Micha Regev, a former settler activist, explained that Tagmahir violence is motivated by a blind and dangerous hatred and theology. He argues that, and I'm quoting, external rabbis who hate all Arabs living on the land that belongs to the Jewish people believe that it is now the age of redemption, that Arabs are contaminating the land, mm -hmm. and that the Jewish people should reign over the entire land of Israel. To become truly sovereign Jews must provoke the situation creating a religious war with the Arabs. End of quote. The actions of Tag Mechir movement are justified in the book of Torah HaMelech, which is another, uh, the King's Torah, as the Shapira and Elitzur mentioned, written by two prominent settler rabbis. According to this volume, which provides quasi-religious foundations for Tag Mechir, the aim of the group is to secure the right of the Jews in the promised land. The violent act of Tag Mechir, supported by theological logic, offered a glimpse of the constitution of surveillance and informal policing while creating a sense of fear and insecurity that dominates the lives of Palestinians and their supporters. Now, the everydayness of unpredictable Tag Mehir attacks and racism added to state-sponsored acts by commission or omission of price-tagging Palestinians creates spatial and social relations of alienation. And here the question really is how do we, how could we analyze and understand the entire conditions? What we see as Fanon would say that Hemming in the colonized, producing knowledge, statistics, and publication that point to the need to fear them and dividing their spaces into compartments to ensure that they stay in their place and do not exceed their limits are but some forms of colonial control and surveillance. <coughs> Colonial control and its surveillance regime can't be practiced through spatial separations and confinement, as well as through control of bodies, language, visual image, media coverage, and so on. And in the latest work that I'm, 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 I'm just came from, from San Diego presenting a paper, I claim that it's not only the inscription of power <coughs> over the body and over the land, it's not only biopolitics and geopolitics. It's much more than this. I claim that this occupation is the occupation of senses. The fact that you hear what I showed in the video, the fact that you see every time the surveillance over the wall, the surveillance over the, 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 the bedroom, surveillance over burning body, and in one of the chapter I look at the inscription of power over dead body, whereby even as dead Palestinians are unable to bury their beloved ones and just look at the situation lately where dead Palestinian bodies and fa families are waiting to get back the bodies of their, their children and the amount of, of, of trading over those dead bodies. So what I'm claiming is that this reading and writing of the living power of Palestinian dead bodies requires further analysis and careful analysis of how this surveillance machine is really working in, inside the space, inside the time, and inside the, on, in the body the living or the dead of, of Palestinians. Now, here I, I kind of look at colonial control and its surveillance regime that is practiced through spatial separation and confinement, but through, I said, language and image. And these, you know, services that reflect on empire rhetoric and visuality have articulated how language and images are technologies of power used to galvanize power. Words and images are never just words and images, and at times they themselves become technologies <coughs> for contesting power to produce knowledge about who should fear who and why, and demonstrate how power holders can invent modes to securitize and impose surveillance <coughs> over the feared other. The eviction of the non-Jew intensified here among the colonizers 
preserve the purity and the exclusivity of Jewishness in, inside uh, historic Palestine and produces an eliminatory, discriminatory condition that turns Palestinian into threatening entities that, that requires constant policing. Fear of the colonized is galvanized by two mutual inclusive theologies, mobilized by two main powers. One theology, and this is how the book argued, is based on religious claims. It's about the sacred and the profane. It's about God who gave the land to one people and who, you know, turning God into a real estate agent that could divide the land. <laughs> so from one side, we have this, this theology that is biblical theology, that there is the sacred and the chosen people, and the other is based on Zionist colonial eliminatory ideology that is defined into this security theology. So together they construct a security theology that aims at securing the Jewish people in their land. And I wish to argue that the gravity of Pagnachir aims not only to de-Arabize the land, mm -hmm. because Arabs out, Muhammad is there, and so on, but also to empty it from all non-Jews. The gravity, therefore, carries implicit statements against Christians, against Muslims, and against Palestinian <coughs> people, and, and, and while stating that there is a price tag for being there. The colonizer, for their part, aim their work in its formal, legal, and, of course, a theatrical one, as you have seen in the video, because it's about performativity. Mm -hmm. It's about this theatricality theatricality of power that is invading every aspect of the land, of the, of the even senses, this is why I call it the occupation of senses, is there to show this game between the uh, biblical theology and the security one. And it's, it's kind of in line of reasoning that the colonizer's inscription of power over the body uh, of the native reveal not only their sense of being hunted by the native, but also their perceived need to safeguard themselves from the natives' vulgarity and primitivity. This preoccupation with securing and protecting themselves is transformed into the colonizer's right to oppress. And as Fanon explains, the colonizer's preoccupation with security makes him remind the native out loud that there he alone is the master. The settler or the policeman has the right, the lifelong day, to strike the native, to insult him, and to make him cruel to them, as the man say. Thus, surveillance and control strategies, as well as laws and regulations, are developed. In sum, the production of fear produces the body, it produces social relations, and socio-political order in the colonized world. Such production manifests the political power of the colonizer and sustain a continuum of oppressive disciplinary power relations, a constant silent war that inscribes relation of force through the visible and the invisible way, institutions, bureaucracies, and language, whether they are conducted by the state or by other uh, people as we have seen. So in pursuing the logic of colonial framework, Mbembe, Ashil Mbembe, uh, suggests that colonial occupation combines two elements, the biopolitical element and the necropolitical disciplinary power over the body. That is, and I quote, the various ways in which our contemporary world weapons are deployed in the interest of maximum destruction of persons and the creation of the world. Now, Mbembe suggests that there is, necropolitics is there is an economy a political economy of life and death that allows one group to live in one way and the other to die. So the question is how do we live and how do we die is based on this political, uh, necropolitical um, game. Now offering Palestine as an example of that word, Mbembe suggests that the infrastructural warfare allows for the invisible killing and outright execution of Palestine. He explains how the looting of the space, the place, the water, the resources, with brutal control of the, over the individual's accessibility and mobility creates a death world for the living dead. In that sense, in the various chapters of my book and the articulation of the global regime, 
uh, enables me to theorize an epistemology of details and that tracks the minute element that mobilize the grammar of race and so to the point the marking of the difference between the seen and the unseen, the people and the unpeople, while keeping in mind that the logic of erasure and elimination differ in different times and spaces and that enforce the racial categories that shift of the, uh, in this political economy. I think I would stop here and allow more questions, but I would say that what, what the book goes in, the book starts with situating the analysis in settler colonialism and, and how Israel is a settler colonial state and then goes and looking at surveillance. So I start with surveillance over the walls. So I bring Tag Mechir to the forefront. I move into surveillance over the bedroom with a chapter on, on Israel in my bedroom while looking at the Israeli citizenship law. I move into the Nakba law where it's the criminalization of the, of the mere commemoration of the Nakba that is surveillance over the memory then into the home and surveillance over the home and how housing demolition and then I move into dead bodies to show how you know I kind of it's based on a long research that not only I look at court decisions and at issues related to two barriers in Jerusalem but I also kind of interview dead bodies from the moment they die till the moment they're buried and show the inscription of power over the dead bodies and the way Israel prevents even dead bodies from from reaching the, the, the graveyards. And I end up, the book will be looking at birth. I was hoping, you know, with my discussions with the, with the, uh, with the editors that, you know, if I will end with birth, that would be a, you know, a more hopeful note. But then talking to, interviewing women and having 120 women answering uh, a questionnaire, it's a both empirical and uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, study, I, l I, I kind of discovered that this security theology and the surveillance is really, you know, working out this machinery of fear, this industry of fear, not only in spaces and in geopolitical manner, not only in biopolitical manner, even in the burning body. And this is how I end up the book by looking at, by stressing that we need to look at everydayness and theorize around everydayness. We need to look at the minute details because the details are the ones that tell us how this machinery of oppression and dispossession is working. And we need to check what is going on with this necropolitical regime and how can we really help stop decolonize this very tough situation. I'll stop. Yeah. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, as moderator, I'm going to take the, um, the privilege of asking the first question, or maybe the first couple of questions. Uh, so, could you just speak to me? Sure. Um, and we're very fortunate in UCLA to have opportunities to engage with the sort of everyday politics of occupation because of also the work of Sadi Mastasi, who's here with us today, and who has exemplified that in his own work. But what you brought to the table, which is, I think, especially um, important at a law school, is the way in which law and regulation really penetrates that story. So it's really a law and society approach that looks at how law is instrumentalized and regulatory authority is instrumentalized. And I find that fascinating and a really great compliment to work that is also present here at UCLA. So thank you, first of all, for bringing that um, important perspective. And then I wondered, um, and just as my first question, if you might give us a kind of broader picture of how you conceive of the relationship between public and private violence traveling specifically through law. So for example, you gave the example of price tag related violence and the, the failure to investigate or the failure to prosecute. But then you also noted an, a, a case that was made exemplary, both because of its horrible severity, namely the um, arson attack and death of an entire family, but on the other hand, the decision to prosecute, the decision to investigate and prosecute. So that suggests a kind of interesting deployment of law and the power of the state to, to generate accountability in ways that are designed in part to mask the everyday use of law and regulation to repress in the way that you describe. In other words, to say, look, here's an exemplary prosecution. We do hold our own accountable, or this is subject to law and so forth. So I wonder if you have thoughts on how that deployment of law 
in order to suggest that public authority does regulate private violence in some way, that there is this distinction still maintained, how that operates in your story. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for your question, Asla. I think that this is the really the challenge. The challenge is how, how, when, and why the law is used or not used. And I think that Tag Mechir price tag is a great example of how for years, you know, acts of vandalism, of writing Arabs out, of, fear, of, of scaring the entire uh, areas, and the state was aware, and the media was covering, and, and, and the television was covering, and everybody knew, and there was an organization in, created in Tel Aviv by Jewish rabbis against it. You know, it, it was called Tag Meir, which is against Tag Meir. It's not price tagging, it's something that bringing light to it. And in the name of the same theology the, 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 and the biblical rights. But yet there was no prosecution until they started abusing soldiers in different settlements and causing harm to their own people. And they have burned, um, tried to burn a house of one of the Israeli leftists in, in uh, Jerusalem, in West Jerusalem. So the question is when do you use the law and whether the law is a tool of, of um, of uh, emancipation, as, as Bermatura de Santos would say, or a tool of oppression. So you see that from one side you have the Palestinians that are that they would like to use the law, but they're afraid to use the law because you need to remember that you have from one side a person who whose house was um, affected by Tagmahir, okay, by those gratitudes and so on. If they will go and complain, they might be uh, marked by the state and if they are marked their residency might be revoked or their kids might be arrested or or so on so it's such an entanglement of situation whereby palestinians might uh, complain but they won't do it i will give another example of child arrest that i'm looking at currently like lots of kids are kidnapped. We have numbers of over 1,000 kids in East Jerusalem that are being kidnapped by the uh, police, border patrol, military, whatever you want to call it, Israelis would call it the police. I definitely call it the military. You know, it's different ways, but kidnapped, <coughs> uh, being held in, in, uh, in those ships for three, four hours, beaten and returned to their families. Now, according to the Israeli law, this is a clear violation of uh, law enforcement people. Palestinian families would very much fear going and complaining, even if they have a child who's, who's badly injured, because they're afraid that then the authorities and the authorities would, would start marking them, would won't allow them to find a job, would kick them out of jobs, would take their... their um, uh, health insurance, uh, IDs, and so on. So the system is it works all in such a harsh way, whereby this is why I think that it's not about intersecting powers. It's really about interlocking powers. Something is being blocked. And by the use of law, the use of law in one case and the lack of the use of law in the other case creates such a confusion among the colonized from one side. But the colonizer feels that they could get away with it. They know that they could walk, you know, the videos that I have shown. Some of them are videos from the window of my house, you know, Susan was there and so on. Right, uh, talking about dead bodies, you know, Sari have written about Mamilla and so on, but thinking that your beloved ones might die and you can't bury them is a catastrophe, right. especially in those moments, in those very private moments. So it's, it's this public that is invading but invading viciously the private to the degree that it creates such a confusion where Palestinians with, with kids that were kidnapped and, and badly injured cannot uh, file a complaint, they cannot go to court, but at the same time they need to, to go to court. So there are so many uh, aspects of this situation that is creating lots of hardships. In, and, and you know, the citizenship law is one issue, but there are so many cases of, of, of when to use the law and when to use the law in order to further abuse the abuse is, is another way of looking at it. Uh, so as I already have mentioned, a second question, sorry that I will read <laughs> this, but um, you mentioned that the Tag Mahir, the goal based on the Kofinia, based on uh, their own statements and so forth, appears to be emptying the land of non-Jews and targeting not just 
using the language of Palestinians or Arabs or using the language of Muslims, etc., but also Armenians and Greeks and this and that. And I just wonder what kinds of differentiation you see, if any, amongst non-Jews that are being targeted. In other words, are these groups imagining or reinscribing hierarchies? Are they engaging in violence that tracks ways that hierarchies may already exist in public action? Or is there a set of distinctions that you see in your work in the way they treat non-Jews, or is it just a category that's undifferentiated? It's, it's, a, it's a category of non-Jews. You, know, you have the Jews, so whether Christians, Muslims, Greeks, Armenians, whatever. And I think that lately the state is really confused because, for example, during this Christmas and seeing, you know, uh, Christmas Day is the day of the whores and on 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 the bu on buildings in, in in the old city of Jerusalem and uh, <coughs> writing graffitis on the Dormition, which is exactly in, in Zion Gate. There have created such a confusion because we are also, you know, the Armenian quarter is neighboring the Jewish quarter. So creating conflict in such a small area is a catastrophe. It is a real catastrophe. So well, how do you handle it? And the fact that the state is unable to control, or you know, they claim they don't know who did, who did it. But I assure you, if I will do it, they will find me because <laughs> camera. And if you will look at the uh, at the camera on the on the book, cameras are all over. Cameras are all over. So it's surveillance and and. Uh, Security devices are all over. Somehow they do not know what to do. And maybe another harsh example, again, you know, connecting it to your previous question, regarding law and the case of Muhammad Abu Khdeir. Muhammad Abu Khdeir was burned alive. You know, they, they poured gasoline and they, they, and they burned him alive while there. And this is a group of three men. They found them. There were videos. Yeah, there were footage. But now we read the indictment. You will fail. If if we know who kidnapped him and how they killed him, why are they in jail? Now, of course, two of them have OCD and uh, obsessive compulsive uh, disorder, and one of them is not uh, stable mentally. Mm. So when you when you end up telling his family, the Abu Khdeir family, that yes, your son was burned alive. And, uh, and especially in the Israeli media, they said that not only they burned, they wanted to see him burning, so they did, they made, um, what do you call it, uh, barbecues, because they wanted to really see him. To hear this, and then to see that the law is not even in such a case functioning, is, and, and to read the indictment. The indictment itself is kind of justifying it, you know. In, in so many ways, even in one place in the indictment, because I was translating it, it's like really fascinating. Instead of saying the uncle of the deceased, because Palestinian cannot be deceived, they said the uncle of the terrorist. <laughs> I was like, and it's in the indictment, in the in the Hebrew, and, and I was like, oh, of course it's a it's a Freudian slip, but it's an interesting Freudian slip. <laughs> okay, so I saw um, the hand up to Crystal. Um, I'm struck by the, the parallel between undocumented workers in the U.S. and undocumented or undocumented whole um, Palestinians in our own country. And the, the organization would speak, would use the law for them to try to shield, shield them from, from the state. Are those organizations available, active, you know, legal aid kind of organizations, yeah. including the kind that you've been involved in. That's a good question, because when you're talking about foreigners, for example, Sudanic kids in Israel that are undocumented and so on, there are organizations. In relation to Palestinians, and we're talking about over 120,000 Palestinians, the situation differs, and this is where comes this framework of settler colonialism. What they want is to keep them out of Jerusalem. They don't want them to have a documented documentation. So no birth certificate. So no possibility to use school, no possibility to use health services. So when you think about, and then when you see what is going on today with kids being arrested, throwing stones, and so on, you wonder why. And the question is that in especially in occupied East Jerusalem, 
organizations could work in helping families apply for what, what is called family reunification, but lately there's almost no possibility to, to get this family reunification. And if they do, every year they need to check whether the family is behaving, the children are behaving, mm -hmm. and so on. So this surveillance and this production of fear that fears the Palestinian, when you know a, a report by um, by Israeli militaries that are working in, in Jerusalem say that for them, every Palestinian child is a potential terrorist. So why should they document them? And what, so mm -hmm. even if you will look, you know, the latest report by the Israeli Council for the Child, Matzalio Mitzvah Shlom 2015, reports that because previously, last year, it was 76% of the undocumented kids are in East Jerusalem, today 79.3 so the number is increasing so the the national council for the child in israel is aware of it now talking about law and talking about whether they're doing something about it that's a different question yes sorry above you because Rand was on yes, first sorry, you. Yes. Sorry. go ahead Sandra. sorry oh, sorry <laughs> Well, just as in South Africa, there's a dilemma, and that is that if you put all of the Africans on a Bantu stand, uh, and it's too far away from where you're, you need the labor, then what do you do and how do you resolve that contradiction? And so I'm wondering, you know, every Palestinian child is potentially a terrorist, but every Palestinian child is potentially a laborer. Um, how do you see the Israeli state resolving this issue of meeting Arab <laughs> Palestinian labor and wanting to get rid of them at the same time? The same situation is here in the States as well. Yeah. Well, I, I guess, you know, my, my uh, the analysis I'm offering on these two theologies makes the case of Zionism a bit different than South Africa. Makes it because it's it's not, you know, Palestine is not apartheid South Africa. It's, wor it's worse in so many ways. And the regime is based on dispossession. So the issue of labor is an issue that is fascinating to look at because in, in the case of East Jerusalem, they don't need the Arab hand. They do not. They don't want it also. So for example, if you look at the last two years, unemployment rate is jumping up, and they do not allow, they don't give permits for Arabs to work. And this is why you have a very high rate of poverty. This is why Palestinians in occupied East Jerusalem end up in Ramallah, or in Hebron, mm -hmm. or in Bethlehem. And this is a mode of evicting them, you know, getting them mm -hmm. out. So it's, it's a different, requires a different mode of anal analysis because this logic of elimination is not only the elimination of the identities, it's also the elimination of the Palestinian from being, from being in a specific space, especially uh, uh, occupied East Jerusalem, because this is, you know, this is again the biblical claims and so on. And plus, of course, uh, marking them and drawing them as security threats prevent Israeli people that would like to have Arab workers and Palestinian workers to, to get them. And you hear it all the time. You hear it all the time. So now you see it among Palestinians inside Israel. You know, the discussion around what happened with the two cases lately of stabbing inside Israel, one was in Rishon and the other in, in, in the forward. Now, the question is, the first reaction was never employ an Arab. So, when previously, after 48, the use of the Arab hand and the Arab labor was, was useful for the state and for the establishment of the state, nowadays the best way is not to have the Arab hand. And therefore, you, you really find Palestinians, and as you have said, in Bantustan, but those Bantustans are also Bantustans that are packed with poverty, packed with lots of hardships, packed with lots of violence, and so on. So, with time, and we're talking about a very long period of time, with time, 
uh, that, uh, the, this calculation of, of the contribution to the Israeli economy is not uh, there. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I came in two minutes late, so if you already covered this, I'm sorry, but I'm wondering how um, resistance figures into what you're discussing. Can you talk loud? With the um, refinement of you know, these mechanisms of surveillance and encroachment upon all aspects of court in existence, I'm wondering if that in turn informs the types of anti colonial resistance that you're seeing. Um, and I'm not necessarily even thinking of anything dramatic, but perhaps even in the way there's an everyday occupation, is there an everyday type of Definitely, you know. I think that um, I think that it's uh, for every power there's a counter power. So when you see the violence and power, you see so many reactions and so many acts of resistance. I could I could tell you that you know, in in looking in, in, in reading the chapter on that, you see that Palestinians have seen how Israel is marking dead bodies as security threats, but at the same time which is fascinating and which is painful, but this is what I, what I show clearly in the chapter, is you know, in one case that I have documented was the case of an engineer who was born in Jerusalem, came to the US to study, came back, his uh, identity was revoked, but his family, his kids were there, and they gave him a permit, and every year his permit was, was renewed. One day he came back from work and he had a heart attack and died. Now, the family wanted him to, to bury him in the family barrier in Salah Din Street. When they tried to bring the dead body, the Israeli soldiers on the checkpoint said, well, he had a permit to pass as a living body, oh. but not as a dead body. Mm -hmm. Now, the wife was so adamant to bury him in this, she ended up sneaking him. I mean, literally sneaking him under the chair in the, in the car and getting him in. In, <coughs> in another case of an Armenian, who also his wife died suddenly in Bejala while visiting her mom, and then he learned that he can't bury her. It was so hard to believe it, but he put her in the, on the seat in the car, put the seat belt, crossed the checkpoint, and, and sneaked her in. Now, resistance is always there. Children throwing a stone is, is in, in so many ways telling Israelis and telling the military, we refuse to accept oppression and humiliation as part of our <coughs> life. Now, it is, there's a very high price that kids are paying for this, but there are so many modes of resistance that are there. And unfortunately, on both sides, you see that, you know, that the situation is totally uncontrollable because the political power has a, 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 a regime of control. But resistance, and I could attest to what happened now in the last couple of months. We are uh, a group of Jerusalemite women that are that we feel feel that the Palestinian Authority is not functioning, and the Israelis are not helping us out. And we ended up gathered with something like 120 women. You should see us every morning at seven in the morning. We are divided into groups in uh, in different gates. <laughs> I'm on the Zion gate, the other on the Babel Amul, Babel Khalil, and so on. We help kids reach school. To us, this is resistance. We end up eating kaik in, uh, in Damascus Gate every morning and dividing the road for the second day. But we're doing it for the past four months because the settlers are preventing the kids from reaching school. And we said, at least, we will show the kids that you know, we have those uh, t-shirts, mushalfin, we're not afraid and we're walking every day. We're doing it as a group of women because we believe that this is the only thing, at least to safeguard the path to school. Not that it's helping that much because it's, it also put us in lots of harsh situations, but resistance is there in, in many ways. This may be a very naive question, but is the policy of ultimate removal explicit? Uh, is it obvious? Is it, uh, I, I don't even know how to ask the question, but maybe it's like asking for a smoking gun where there is no such thing, but uh, is it the logical conclusion of a series of policies or, anyhow, that's, yeah. 
Well, if, if you put the puzzle together, you see that, you know, if you look at in terms of going to court, for example, in relation to building a house, okay? 94% of the requests that reach the court to get a permit mm -hmm. to build a home are rejected. Yeah. So, usually the Israeli uh, um, terminology is that Palestinians are building illegal. Mm -hmm. It's unauthorized. It's not illegal. People want to live to stay in their homes. So they still, you know, their son is getting married, so they're building another room for the son. So what you see when you read urban planning, when you read how our streets have changed. Now I'm from Haifa, yeah? My street used to be Al Muhallas, the savior street. Today it's Yudam al -Payadis. So the name was changed to a Jewish name. In Jerusalem, it was Su al -Husar. Today it's Chabad Street. And I'm numbered lately. When you came, I was not numbered. Now I'm number 94. I'm lit. Finally, I have a number. Because in the thing about buying a fridge, and you don't know how to tell the guy to bring the fridge to where, because <laughs> I have a street, but I don't have a, where to deliver it. So these are maybe simple things, but, but it's the everydayness. This is why the book talks about the everydayness. It talks about the internet. It talks about really what happens on your way to school, on your way to giving birth, while burying your beloved ones, trying to build a house, trying to remember what goes on, waking up in the morning and not seeing those graffiti on the wall. So I don't, I, I do not want to say that it's about erasing Palestinians, but um, I think that the erasure is cultural, is political, is the erasure of the identity, and so many other way, other things, and. It's getting worse every day. And the past five months, you know, the book was, <coughs> was, went out to, to, you know, I submitted it in July, so I did not even include Muhammad Abu Khdeir and the case of Duma and so on. And hopefully my next book will be on children because I also feel lately that this logic of elimination is really targeting children. Totally targeting children. And so the space was done and was stolen, you know, and, and the area is not ours, the streets are not ours, the ability to move, the songs, the settlers in the old city, the, the flags, everything is so strong, but then, you know, children, this is really, really, really very tough to see how, you know, um, I just finished an article to a journal and it's based on my narrative of helping children reaching school every day and in one of the cases I told the teacher you know stop teaching them just sing dance do something else <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm willing to pay for a clown there's a female clown so we brought the female mm -hmm. clown after two three days she called me and she said come Osama wants to show you what he drew so he drew a clown and he was showing me I said wow what is it he said a Palestinian clown I said okay what is a Palestinian clown you know what he answered me? Clouds in Palestine cry. Mm -hmm. And he drew a crying clown. Now, this is a mode of, 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 of elimination that is different, that is really invading the mere childhood, the mere ability to look at a clown as a clown. Sorry, I wonder if you could turn back to the chart that you have about the birth statistics and mm -hmm. say a little bit more about that. I mean, I have some inclinations about what's underneath that, but if, if you could unpack that a bit more. Yeah, yeah well, this is a, a chart that I it took me a while to, to put this chart together because it's not always possible to um, but it was based on my, um, when I started doing the study on birth in Jerusalem, um, where is it? When I started doing the study on birth in Jerusalem, I was, uh, you know, as I do usually, I interview women, I went to the hospitals, and I 
decided to build a questionnaire, so it was really based on a long questionnaire. And, uh, and then I said, let me see the situation. This is 2011. This is, it's not lately because I, we, I don't have from the Israeli Central Statistics Bureau data now, so it's, it's uh, kind of old. But when you look at this, you see that there is a narrative, a discourse, that is produced by the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics and the Israeli Institute for Jerusalem Studies, or the Jerusalem Institute for Israeli Studies, whereby they are telling, they're telling a story that there are a bit, there's a big number of Palestinians, and this is a demographic threat to Israelis, you know, going back to Shagai, or even taking it in connection to Amnon Sofer. Amnon Sofer is a demographer, very well-known demographer. And we, in Israel, we, we, we're Palestinians, a scholar called him Amnon Sofer Sofer Arabim. He, he counts how many Arabs. So his name is Sofer Count, mm -hmm. and he counts us. So in, in the case of Jerusalem, what you see is a clear discrepancy that there from one side are producing Palestinian uh, live birth as a demographic threat because they have a high rate of, of childbirth and and from the other side they're saying yes yes but they are not the majority and their number their total number is, is low then you see the palestinian bureau of statistics so the palestinians want to kind of either assure israelis that no we're not having really a large number of kids okay and we're really be behaving ourselves. So you see here, right. over 5,000, you know, and the crude birth rates here, you look at 29.6, then you look at eight, you know, the natural uh, increase where you see 27.9, 0 0.7. So the, the, the discrepancy is so large, mm -hmm. and then the total population is very high. Mm -hmm. So the Palestinian Authority wants to claim control over East Jerusalem and over Jerusalem because Palestinians are in Jerusalem. While the, uh, uh, while the Israelis want to say, no, they are a, uh, Palestinians are a security threat or a demographic threat. So I think that Foucault here could help us <laughs> very well understand because this biopolitical regime is at hand. And when you're producing a group of people as really threatening others from a biopolitical perspective, that means that you need also to um, to start producing tactics, technologies, <coughs> to evict them, you know, going back to my element of the logic of elimination. So either you eliminate them by uh, the number here, <coughs> so, you know, going back to the uh, work of one of the surveillance uh, scholars, Fischbach, who said, you know, rule by number, and it is, Sandra, as you've said, it is in most colonial conditions, but in colonial India, where this entire surveillance over the population, it was colonialism, but not settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. and, and in settler colonial conditions, settlers are there to stay. And if, uh, if are, they are there to stay, they want to evict the natives so as to indigenize themselves. That did not happen in India, in colonial India. Mm -hmm. But it happens in, in uh, Ireland, it, it, uh, is here. It happened in settler colonial conditions. When, and when you look at other settler colonial conditions, you see well, this is what's happening here to the natives. Just look at the situation of the of the natives in the U.S. and, mm -hmm. and look at the way they are with time being eliminated. The, it is built on the logic of elimination, of dispossession, and of dispossession of land, but of culture, and turning them into you know here you have them in in, in different enclaves, and over there it's a process. So they're they're not done with us. When I visited you, we visited um, a community in East Jerusalem that uh, several of the um, families had just gotten their eviction notices. Is that community still there? Yeah, well, they were evicted. They ended up, when you came, they got the, 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 notice. the notice, but then they were evicted. This is the Sheikh Jarrah community. Uh, so they were evicted. They stayed in the streets for seven months. They told that international media and so on. This is the Hanun family and the Rawi family. That is true. Now, one of their daughters, the young woman that was with us, finished her degree in psychology, and she works with me as my research assistant. <laughs> but she was evicted from the house. 
and the, and the ones that are living in, in that house uh, are uh, Israeli settlers and they won the case in court, going back to the court. So the Sheikh Jarrah case was one, another clear case of, of eviction uh, by using the law, through mm -hmm. you know, the rule of law. And you need to remember that you know, in the 1920s and 30s, Palestinians did not at that time register their lands and so on. Right. So this is why when, when they go to court, they can't even prove. Uh, and they can't go, they look at Ottoman uh, documentations and so on, but it's not always successful, so they were evicted. And the entire 61 people are out. Yeah. David. David, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you about the status of the term theology, because it's interesting, it's not monotheistic in your account, because it's not a sovereign power monolithically declaring between life and death, and it's not a panoptical center of surveillance. And in fact, the Israeli regime seems to work by what Nasser is saying was called hyperlegality, the proliferation of laws, the proliferation of permits, the proliferation of ordinances. And also what you're showing us is a kind of proliferation of agencies. So the Tagma here seems to work as a kind of informal agency of enforcement. So I'm, I'm curious how you're thinking specifically about theology in this and how, how that notion works for you. It's, Paradoxically, yeah. not the monotheistic thing you might expect. Yes, yes. Well, you know, I think that the use of theology came from from the experience of the colonized. Now, you're looking at the function of the state mm -hmm. and the way the role of the state is being done by different agencies and different powers. So, Tagmatir is doing one thing, and the, the um, national insurance in Israel is evicting by revoking the residency and the Minister of Interior Affairs is not issuing uh, IDs and each institution is playing a different game but when you look from the perspective of the natives, when you look from the perspective of the Palestinians you see a condition whereby you have a God and this is why I went into theology because you have a God, when, when, when it comes to security, there is no way you could argue. And how can you argue with God? If God gave him the land, can you argue with God? God gave him the land. So this is why the families were evicted. And if there is another God that is security, and look at your, your country here, they, everybody buys this God. It's Israel's security, and it's a threat to Israel, and so on. Well, even in the court, Asla, even in the court, you know, Judge Bruning, in one of the court decisions regarding uh, the citizenship law, he said that human rights are not prescriptions for national suicide. So he is willing to look at human rights in condition that it is not contrasting this God. And this God is the security of the state that is, in that case, is so sacralized. So politics is so sacralized. And God is God. So we have those two theologies. So when I want to, for example, apply for a passport for my husband, who was born in Jerusalem. He was born before the state of Israel was established. Yeah? But it's still this issue of, of you're, you're faced with this wall that how can you argue with this God? And this is why I thought that theology is the right word because I feel that it, it reflects perceptions of, of those that are uh, living the everydayness, the very intimate effect, the, the, the women that are giving birth, the child that is reaching school. You know, that this is where I thought it's really a, a theology. Yes, I think last question. Yeah, I'm wondering, this is such a depressing picture, and what I'm wondering is what, there must be something that is preventing wholesale slaughter for everybody. Can you speak up? We're talking please. about a, a kind of gradual slaughter, but why is it not going faster? I mean, what kinds of barriers, but is it because of dissension within the Israeli population, or, and, or what is it that this, is there anything? Because it isn't going, there isn't mass slaughter. No. So I will why? 
I will tell you why. My, my argument in the book is very clear. They need to maintain fear, to produce fear, mm -hmm. to fear mm -hmm. the colonizers, the mm -hmm. colonized more. So the maintenance of the Palestinian in a situation, just look at Gaza. So Gaza, you know, as, as uh, uh, Salamanca or as Daryl Lee in his, his article looks at it, it's a laboratory. So they kill a little bit, they dispossess a little bit, they maim, you know, Jaspir Ford just came out with a great article that looks at Gaza and talks about the right to maim. Now, this right, you're not killing that you have the right to maim so that you preserve your democratic uh, uh, nature, so-called democratic nature, maintain Palestinians as security threats and terrorist others, and you could produce more. There is this machinery. There is an industry of fear. So, so it is slowly, slowly, mm -hmm. but at the same time, what it's doing is really, really, really major. And mainly, as I'm, I'm now working on, on, on the issues of children, whereby I look at the dispossession. Because in, in other settler colonial contexts, when we look at Australia, you talk about stolen childhood. I kind of fear using this word because I don't think anybody could steal the childhood. But it's turning childhood into a space of exterminability. Mm -hmm. So they really need to maintain this machinery of oppression. You know, do you know the the book uh, by Kafka, the colony, when you you know put the body and you keep on inscribing on it, mm. something of this sort, but preserving it as a living, uh, as a. Li and this is why I think it's not total mm. extermination. Well, on that happy note, <laughs> <laughs> uh, please join me in thanking Madeline. Thank you.